now. Yeah, so again, uh, welcome everyone to the virtual seminar on geometry with symmetries. And today or tonight or whatever, uh, it's uh, my pleasure to welcome Chess Matnik from uh, National Taiwan University. And he'll be speaking on the second variation of holomorphic curves in the sixth sphere. So thanks, Chess, for joining us. Okay, well, uh, thanks for having me. I'd like to thank the uh, organizers for the invitation to be here. It's a pleasure. And thank you all for coming at uh, whatever hour it is. So, yeah, so this talk is called the second variation of holomorphic curves in the sixth sphere. So holomorphic curves in the sixth sphere are a particular class of minimal surfaces. And the idea of this talk is to study uh, this interesting class of uh, minimal surfaces. Um, and in particular, we're going to be interested in the second variation of area. So I think the best way to start is uh, just in generality. So we're going to consider uh, minimal surfaces in a general Riemannian manifold and recall the formula for the second variation of area. Uh, the second variation of area will be packaged uh, as a, an operator known as the Jacobi operator, and that will motivate the study of its spectrum. Okay, then we'll specialize uh, to the case that we're interested in, which is minimal surfaces in round spheres. And just to give a sense of the type of results we're looking for, I'll mention uh, just a few results about minimal surfaces in the three sphere and the four sphere. I certainly can't give a comprehensive uh, treatment, but I'll mention a few results. Then we'll uh, look at minimal surfaces in the, in the six sphere. And you might ask, well, why, why the six sphere? Well, uh, the six sphere is the only sphere which admits an almost complex structure uh, other than uh, the two sphere, of course. So we're going to give S6 its standard uh, almost complex structure. It's a G2 invariant. As it turns out, it has a large uh, symmetry group. So we're going to give S6 its standard almost complex structure. And with respect to that complex structure, we'll look at uh, the holomorphic curves. And it turns out that holomorphic curves uh, are then minimal surfaces. Now, uh, the generic holomorphic curve in S6 is not really uh, well understood. But uh, what we have a better sense of at the moment is a certain subclass known as the null torsion holomorphic curves. And this ends up being a very uh, rich class. Unfortunately, uh, defining null torsion is a little uh, technical. Um, I'll do my best to define it with the least amount of uh, machinery. But essentially, uh, to the null torsion condition is some sort of analog of uh, null torsion or torsion 0 for curves in R3. So what we're going to do is uh, remember the uh, recall the Frenet frame for curves in R3 and uh, try to have an analog of that for holomorphic curves in the six sphere. So we'll have a holomorphic Frenet frame and uh, that's where to torsion will come from. Okay, so then we'll uh, state the main results. So we have a, a bunch of uh, results to advertise. So uh, a couple of results pertain to closed holomorphic curves. Okay, and we'll uh, close holomorphic curves that are null torsion. And then uh, other results will pertain to the case of holomorphic curves uh, with boundary. And then at the very end, uh, time permitting, uh, I'll mention some, uh, maybe some open questions. Okay, so let's begin. So uh, until the very end of this talk, sigma will denote a closed orientable surface of genus G and area A. Okay, M will denote a Riemannian N manifold and uh, the angle brackets will be the inner product. Okay, so recall that an immersion is a minimal surface if it is a critical point for the area functional. So in other words, for all variations of sigma, uh, you take the area at time t, and you take the derivative at t equals 0, and that derivative of the area gives you 0. So what this means is that minimal surfaces are area minimizing to first order, but not necessarily to second order. So you'd like to measure uh, the extent to which a minimal surface is or is not uh, area minimizing to second order. So we can do that by means of a formula known as the second variation of area. And we'll need a, a bunch of notation uh, for that. This notation will be enforced the entire talk. So d bar will denote the levi civita connection of the ambient space M. dt and d perp are the tangential and normal connections. And Roman numeral two is the second fundamental form. OK, so with that in place, uh, the second variation of area is as follows. If you have a minimal surface uh, u into some Riemannian manifold M, and you take a normal variation, then the second derivative of the area uh, at time t equals 0 is given by the integral of uh, this quantity here. And there are three terms in that integral. So let me tell you what those are. Delta perp is the connection Laplacian. So it's a second order differential operator. B is essentially the second fundamental form, roughly speaking. 
and R is the normal part of the ambient curvature. Okay, so B and R are zeroth order operators, uh, whereas delta perp is somehow the, the main term, it's the, the second order uh, operator coming, it's the connection with possible. Okay, so uh, let's give a name to the operator that appears in this formula. We're gonna call it the Jacobi operator. So that's L is uh, this operator that appears uh, right here. So the Jacobi operator eats a normal vector field and spits out a normal vector field. It is a second order linear differential operator. Okay, now how do we study uh, operators? Well, from linear algebra, we know that a, a good thing to do would be diagonalize uh, the operator, which is to say we're interested in its eigenvalues and eigenspaces. And uh, the Jacobi operator, fortunately for us, is a uh, strongly elliptic operator. So by uh, general theory, the eigenvalues of L form uh, an increasing sequence of real numbers. Okay, so there's some lowest one lambda one, and then it increases all the way to infinity. And the multiplicities of these eigenvalues are all finite. Okay, and we'll denote them by M. So uh, we'll just say, uh, we'll give a word for this. The Jacobi spectrum is the set of not only the eigenvalues, but also uh, their multiplicities. Okay. Uh, so the, the point here is that the second variation of area has been encoded in this operator L. And this operator in turn has been encoded uh, by uh, these numbers, the lambdas and the Ms. So it is uh, very much of fundamental interest to understand uh, for a given minimal surface, you know, what can you say about these eigenvalues lambdas, uh, lambda and the multiplicities x. Okay, and in fact, uh, many fundamental invariants of a minimal surface uh, can be phrased in terms of the spectrum. Uh, for example, maybe you've heard of the uh, Morse index. The Morse index is the space of the variations, which um, I guess decrease area to second order. Okay, well, well that's just, uh, yeah, or it's the dimension of that space rather. So that's just the sum of the uh, multiplicities corresponding to the negative Jacobi eigenvalues. And similarly, the nullity is uh, ms plus one, the dimension of the space for the uh, zero eigenvalue. Okay, and, and you say that a minimal surface U is stable if all of its Jacobi eigenvalues are non-negative and unstable if it has a uh, negative Jacobi eigenvalue. So th this is some standard terminology. Now, what you'd like to do is, uh, given a minimal surface, you'd like to just compute uh, its Jacobi spectrum. But, but this is essentially uh, out of the question. Uh, even in highly symmetric cases, this is just a very hard thing to do. Okay, so the best we can do really is, is get estimates. Okay, we'd like to estimate uh, the lambdas and the m's in terms of maybe uh, more familiar geometric and topological quantities. And, and even doing that is a non-trivial uh, thing. But but that's what we're going to uh, work towards. Yes. Okay, so uh, yes. yes, can I ask you uh, yes. the, the difficulty of computing the, the spectrum is uh, in the part of the Laplacian or also the other components? The, the operator L has three components. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't know. Um, I don't think I have a very good answer for that. I, I just don't. I, I think I'm not really able to say very much other than that I know very few minimal surfaces for which the Jacobi spectrum is actually known. Uh, there seem to be very, very few examples. And certainly I, I uh, have tried to work through an example and, and just I found it to be pretty challenging. Um, I mean, certainly there are conditions under which, you know, B or R are, are simpler if you assume constant curvature or something like that, or the, the second fundamental form is parallel. Maybe you can say more, but um, yeah, I don't think there are many examples where we really know the Jacobi spectrum. I'm, I'm not. I don't think I can really say why that is. Uh, I don't have anything intelligent to say, I'm sorry. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, so let's, uh, so there's a whole body of literature on, on this that continues to grow. Uh, I'm gonna focus uh, for the rest of this talk on the case where the ambient space is the round uh, sphere. And, I'm, and when I say round sphere, I'm always gonna assume uh, constant curvature one. Okay, so uh, again, there's a million results on this, but uh, one of the fundamental results is due to Jim Simons who showed that every minimal surface uh, in the n-sphere is unstable, right? So the, there's always a negative Jacobi eigenvalue. In fact, the lowest uh, Jacobi eigenvalue is uh, negative two. Uh, in the same paper, uh, Simon showed that the Morse index is at least n minus two. Uh, equality holds if and only if uh, your surface is the totally geodesic S2. And uh, there's also a nullity bound. And again, equality, uh, this is sharp. Equality holds if and only if your surface is the totally geodesic uh, two-sphere. Uh, one thing this leaves out is uh, what is the multiplicity 
of lambda one. And I think in general, we, we maybe we don't know, or at least I, I don't know in general what the multiplicity of, of lambda one is uh, in general. Um, but uh, one theorem we have, uh, one case in which we have an explicit formula uh, is due to a jury where you have uh, an even dimensional sphere and your surface uh, sigma is genus zero. Okay, so in, in, in that setting where you have a genus zero surface inside an uh, even dimensional uh, sphere, Ajiri showed that the multiplicity of the lowest eigenvalue uh, has this nice formula. It's the area over pi plus two times k minus three. Okay, so Ajiri's argument was complex geometric. He used uh, Riemann rock, and uh, the genus zero assumption was used to invoke the Birkhoff Groth and Geek uh, splitting theorem, which is to say the classification of holomorphic vector bundles over CP1. Right, so the holomorphic vector bundles over CP1 are, are classified, and uh, that was used um, kind of to get this equality. So it, 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 that aspect of the proof uh, definitely does not generalize to higher genus, but other aspects do. Um, and I will return to that later in the talk. That, that's uh, an important point. Sorry, one last question, Les. Um, yeah. You said he proved it with holomorphic data, but uh, yes, as 2K doesn't have a complex structure, how do you get a complex structure on the normal bundle or whatever? Anita, can yeah. you hear me? Yes. Oh, I think uh, that question broke his connection. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, sorry, my connection broke. Sorry. <laughs> uh, let's wait. Uh, let's wait a few, a few seconds. Uh, see if he can reconnect. I'm sure uh, he'll be able to reconnect. Sorry, can you hear me? You might. You might yes, yes, yes. Pause the recording. Okay, yeah. Okay, so my question pause the recording. Sorry. And yeah, we can continue now. So what was the question again, Benjamin? So it, just because you mentioned that um, to prove this result of it, jury, you associate some holomorphic. So you use the Riemann Roch theorem, but I wondered if the normal bundle of any S2 and S2K is always equipped with a complex structure or how you get there. Yeah, there's some there's some complex structure you can put on the normal bundle, um, exactly. And then using that complex structure, you then have to decide what your uh, holomorphic structure is. Uh, that comes from the normal part of the levi civita connection. And uh, yeah, that gives the normal bundle the structure of a uh, holomorphic vector bundle over uh, CP1 or, or S2. In this case, um, but I'm, I'm going to very much return to that point uh, later in the talk uh, because Ajiri's argument is going to be uh, important to us uh, later. Okay, uh, thank you. Sorry for delaying the talk by uh, 10 minutes. Yeah. No, no problem. <laughs> okay, I also have a question. So here, yeah. do you assume uh, the two spheres embedded? Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, I think immersed is fine. Okay. So as a corollary, uh, the error has to be an uh, integer multiple of pi? Yes, that was actually known uh, back uh, with uh, the work of Kalabi in the 60s. Okay, okay. Yeah, that's a fact about minimal two spheres and even dimensional spheres, that's right. Um, let's see, right. So I just want to mention uh, a couple of results uh, for minimal surfaces in uh, low dimensional spheres, just to give a sense of what's known. Uh, this is certainly not a comprehensive overview. So one um, you know, rather well-known result is due to Urbano, who showed that if your surface is not the totally geodesic S2, then in fact, the Morse index is at least five. Uh, and moreover, this is sharp. Uh, the quality holds if and only if your uh, minimal surface is the Clifford torus. And uh, just as an illustration of the power of this index uh, characterization of the Clifford torus, this was a, a very important ingredient uh, in Marquez and Neve's resolution of the Wilmore conjecture. So, you know, these index estimates, I think, are, are very important in and of themselves, but uh, they also uh, have uh, pretty deep ramifications. Uh, but really, we're interested in the case of higher co-dimension. And so uh, a part of the motivation for this talk comes from 
the inspiration for, the, for this talk rather comes from the case of minimal surfaces in the four sphere. And so there's some really interesting results in that direction. Uh, one of them is due to uh, McAuliffe and Wilson, who gave a very general uh, lower bound for the Morse index of a minimal surface in the four sphere. They proved that the Morse index is at least uh, one half times the area over pi minus the Euler characteristic. And um, what to say? Yeah, and it turns out that this is actually a topological lower bound in a sense. The area can be shown to be more or less equivalent uh, to the Euler characteristic of the normal bundle. Okay, but this lower bound is uh, not sharp. Uh, it was shown, for example, by uh, Montiel and Urbano that if you restrict uh, to a subclass of minimal surfaces, the so-called infinitesimally holomorphic or super minimal surfaces, uh, these are the minimal surfaces whose second fundamental forms have uh, the symmetries of a complex curve. If you restrict to this uh, subclass of uh, minimal surfaces, Montiel and Urbano were able to obtain you know, remarkably precise uh, information. It's, you know, it's very rare that you're able to get a, an explicit formula for the Morse index, and, and they were able to do that because uh, it turns out that in this case, there's only one negative eigenvalue. Uh, for the Jacobi operator, uh, negative two is the only uh, negative eigenvalue, so the Morse index is uh, M1, and they were able to show that M1 uh, equals this number. And they also, uh, in the same paper, got a uh, very nice bound for the nullity, which in fact is an equality uh, for genus zero and one. And uh, it turns out that there are, in fact, uh, examples of compact, uh, infinitesimally holomorphic surfaces in the four sphere of every genus, and in fact, every conformal structure by a theorem of Robert Bryan. Uh, these formulas were very much the uh, inspiration uh, for this work. Okay, and a, uh, a recent result I'll mention as well, there's a sort of a higher dimensional generalization of uh, Urbano's result, very recent. Uh, Kostner and Wong uh, considered a minimal tori in the four sphere and showed that the index has to be at least six. And uh, again, equality holds if and only if uh, the surface is a Clifford torus and the total G is S3. So uh, we're going to be interested in the sixth sphere. So the core dimension is. Before, is, is, before yeah. you move on to the, to the sixth sphere, so I'm not uh, that, I'm not that familiar with all these results, but how, how does one prove bounds on the index? Do you actually construct the, 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 the variations that uh, decrease the area or? Yeah, well, there's different uh, approaches. Uh, many of these papers use uh, complex analysis, uh, so complex geometry. So yeah, you have uh, some sort of holomorphic interpretation of the uh, of vector fields which decrease the area, and you can appeal to Riemann rock to construct the variations. That's uh, what I'm going to do, something like that. But other papers recently use uh, min-max theory. Some people use uh, harmonic functions. There's uh, sort of more, uh, you know, less complex geometric, uh, more GMT methods as well that are. Uh, Omgren Pitts style things that are in use that, mm -hmm. that I'm definitely not familiar with. Uh, yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. So let's see. So, it, yeah. So, the, the N sphere, like I said, uh, the, the six sphere is the only sphere which admits an almost complex structure uh, besides the two sphere. And it's a famous open problem as to whether the six sphere admits an integrable uh, almost complex structure that, that continues to be open. So, we're going to give the six sphere its uh, standard almost complex structure. And um, one way to define that is to use the so-called seven-dimensional uh, vector cross product. So there's a very famous seven-dimensional vector cross product on R7, and that's basically what J is. Or if you like, um, if you think of S6 as sitting inside R7 in the usual way, and you think of R7 as the imaginary octonians, uh, this cross product is just one half uh, the commutator where this, these products refer to uh, products of octonians. Uh, this almost complex structure is compatible with the round metric, so it is an isometry. And uh, again, J has a, a large uh, symmetry group. Its automorphism group, I believe, is uh, G2. Okay, so given uh, this J and the compatible uh, round metric, you can write down this uh, two-form, uh, often called the Kähler two-form. It's just what it's called. Uh, omega of x, y is uh, angle bracket J, x, comma, y. And so this package that we now have is, is uh, an almost Hermitian structure on S6. And uh, again, uh, let me just remind you that D bar is our uh, notation for the levy chivita connection on the sixth sphere. So uh, at first glance, this almost Hermitian structure is pretty terrible, right? I mean, uh, omega is not closed. Uh, we call it a Kähler form anyway, but omega is not closed. So this manifold is not symplectic. Uh, J is not integrable. And for Either of those reasons, uh, J is not parallel for the Levy-Chapita connection. So, so this seems like an awful thing to look at. Uh, the good news is that this structure is uh, nearly Kähler. And there's a bunch of different ways to define it, uh, what nearly Kähler means. The simplest one is to say this, 
uh, the Levy Civita connection of J is not zero, but it is uh, skew symmetric. Okay, this is a very important condition. It relates to G2 geometry. I'll only tangentially mention that later, but um, suffice it to say that this is a very good condition. Uh, one thing we get also, by the way, is, uh, you know, just, I think this is pretty general. You can cook up uh, a different connection, which I'm just gonna call the unitary connection, uh, Nabla bar. And this connection does have torsion, but it has the nice feature that it preserves uh, the almost termission structure. So this uh, new strange connection maybe uh, preserves J and omega. So in a sense, uh, despite the fact that Nabla has torsion, it is perhaps a more geometrically natural uh, connection to work with. So we have this uh, package, this almost termission structure. We have a J and an omega. And with respect to this structure, there are uh, a distinguished class of surfaces known as the holomorphic curves. So uh, an immersed surface is called a holomorphic curve if its tangent spaces are invariant under J. Okay, an equivalent condition is that omega uh, restricts to the surface to be uh, the volume form. So uh, it is a nice fact that uh, holomorphic curves and S6 are in fact minimal surfaces. So there's a couple of ways to see this, uh, both of which are pretty instructive, I think. So one way is to just you know, take the holomorphic curve definition and you, roughly speaking, differentiate it. And you'll find that the second fundamental form has some extra symmetries. Okay, it kind of respects J in a certain sense. And those symmetries imply in particular uh, that the trace is zero. So you, you kind of get more than just being, uh, more than just minimality. Another proof is uh, quite interesting. It relates to G2 geometry. So if you have a surface in the sixth sphere, you can take its cone in R7. That'll be a three-dimensional cone in R7. And it turns out that your surface in S6 is a holomorphic curve if and only if your cone is what's known as an associative threefold. Okay, I'm not gonna go into the definition of that, but uh, suffice it to say that associative threefolds, these are calibrated submanifolds. So they are homologically volume minimized. Okay, so, so these associative threefolds, these cones over holomorphic curves, these are very, very uh, strongly volume minimizing uh, minimal submanifolds, uh, first defined by Harvey and Lawson and very, very central to G2 geometry, where they play a role analogous to that of holomorphic curves and symplectic geometry. And, and secretly, this is my reason for uh, caring about the subject. Um, the point is that if you have a holomorphic curve in the sixth sphere, then its cone is a homological uh, volume minimizer and consequently its link uh, is a minimal surface. So this is a, a second proof of, of the minimality of holomorphic curves. Okay, so holomorphic curves are minimal surfaces. Uh, let's study them from the point of view of minimal surface theory. What can you say about the Jacobi spectrum? Okay, so let me just summarize what we know already about general minimal surfaces in the sixth sphere. We know that the first Jacobi eigenvalue is negative two. We know that the index is at least four, the nullity is at least 12. And we also know from a jury that if the genus is zero, then we have this nice formula for the multiplicity of lambda one. So the hope is that maybe if you restrict attention to holomorphic curves, you might be able to you know, get some information uh, even in the case where the genus is uh, higher. That's, that's what we're gonna hope uh, to do. So uh, the starting point, or one starting point at least, is to look at Ajiri's argument. And Ajiri uh, looks at, again, general minimal surfaces and even dimensional spheres, but you take his argument and you just restrict attention to the holomorphic curves. In fact, we'll restrict attention even further to what's known as the null torsion holomorphic curves. I'll explain this later. And it turns out that for any genus, his proof goes through perfectly fine and you get this uh, lower bound uh, on the multiplicity of the first eigenvalue. It is at least the area over pi. Okay, so we're gonna restrict attention uh, for a moment to the class of null torsion curves, but let me explain what null torsion means. Okay, it is uh, defined by analogy with the torsion of a curve in R3. Uh, let's just quickly review that. So uh, suppose you have a curve in R3, call it alpha. How will you study the geometry of your curve in R3? Well, uh, to do computations, you should take an or oriented orthonormal frame, E1, E2, E3, along your curve, and you should adapt your frame uh, to the geometry of the curve. So we'll do that in two steps. So first, let's arrange for E1 to be tangent and E2 and E3 to be normal. Okay, and so now we, we now have some freedom in E2 and E3. And uh, let's you know, take advantage of this freedom and let's have uh, E2 point in the direction that the curve is curving, so to speak. So at points where the second derivative is uh, not zero, arrange for E2 to be in the span of the second derivative that forces E3 to be E1 times E2, okay, the cross product. 
Okay, so when you uh, adapt your frames in this way, you typically call your frame T and B, and you call it a, a Frenet frame. Okay, so what? Uh, well, the point is that if you take your Frenet frame and you take the derivatives of your Frenet frame, express those derivatives in terms of the frame itself, uh, you'll get uh, some invariance. Some functions will pop out, uh, kappa and tau. This is uh, sort of your undergraduate differential geometry course here. And uh, these two functions, kappa and tau, are, are very geometrically significant. So kappa is uh, sometimes called the curvature of the curve. Uh, strictly speaking, it's the mean curvature of the curve. Uh, it's a second order invariant and it measures the failure of your curve to be aligned. Okay, and tau is the torsion of your curve. It is a third order invariant. It vanishes precisely when your curve is a plane curve. Okay, so th this is a, a you, know, you can prove various theorems about these things. Okay, so this is somehow the, the way you study the geometry of curves in R3. And what we'd like to do is have a similar apparatus for holomorphic curves in S6. We'd like a Frenet frame style formalism. Okay, this was done by Robert Bryant in the 80s. And let me uh, very quickly review that so that we can uh, say what we want to discuss. So let's say you have an immersed oriented holomorphic curve in the sixth sphere. Let's look at the tangent bundle of S6 and complexify it. And because we have a J, we can look at the one zero and zero one parts. So let's look at the one zero vectors along the curve. So this is the one zero vectors along the holomorphic curve and split it into tangent and normal. Okay, so this is a complex rank one and this is complex rank two as bundles over the surface. Okay, so let's try to uh, adapt frames to the curve. So let's pick a special unitary frame, E136. Okay, it's unitary with respect to this almost remission structure and special means that there's some complex volume form involved that I am not going to tell you about, but this is uh, an SU3 frame. And uh, from E136, we're going to construct F1, F2, F3 in the usual way. So we now have these one zero vectors uh, along the curve. And F1, F2, F3 are going to be like our TNB. Okay, but let's adapt to the geometry of the curve uh, in the same way. So first F1, uh, let's require it to be tangent and F2 and F3 will be normal. Now, uh, second, let's again arrange for F2 to point in the direction that the curve is curving. And what that means is that F2 will point in the direction of the complexified second fundamental form. Okay, and this makes sense uh, as long as your second fundamental form is, is not zero. Now it turns out that the set of points at which the second fundamental form is zero, that's a finite set. And you do have to worry about it a little bit. Uh, Robert Bryant did worry about it and so did I. I won't bother you with the technicalities, but it ends up not being a problem. Um, of course, when the second fundamental form is identically zero, you have the total geodesic S2 and that's, that's boring. So let's ignore that case. Anyway, a frame adapted in this way, we'll just call it an adapted frame. What should we do? We should take the derivatives of this frame and express it in terms of the frame itself. Okay, now here, uh, the derivative means uh, the unitary uh, covariant derivative, the unitary connection. Okay, so we take the unitary connection of F1 to F3, express it in terms of the frame itself, and you get what's basically the Frenet equations. Okay, we now get these gammas these are connection forms because our frame is not uniquely determined because uh, we're dealing with two plane, real two plane bundles. So there's a little bit of ambiguity here. And zeta is basically the dual of F1. Zeta is E1 plus I2. But the point is that we get these functions kappa and tau, which you can think of as being like uh, the curvature and the torsion. They are not independent of the frame. However, um, you can cook up some objects which encode kappa and tau uh, I won't go into that. The, the point is that the conditions kappa equals zero and tau equals zero, those are well-defined. Okay. So kappa, you can think of as the curvature. And in fact, kappa equals zero is equivalent uh, to your surface being totally geodesic. And tau, you can think of as the torsion. It's some third order object. Um, and we'll say that your polymorphic curve is null torsion if tau equals zero for all uh, adapted frames. So, the question is, what does null torsion mean? Does it mean that your holomorphic curve lies in an S4? Uh, does it lie in an S5? What does it mean geometrically? And the answer is it's a little subtle. It's actually a, a much more subtle than the case of curves in R3. Sorry, Jeff, okay, so, about this unitary yeah. connection. Um, yeah. So, so why is it uh, canonical? I mean, in, in almost Hermitian, you have a bunch of connections which are uh, Hermitian, right, in the sense that they preserve the metric. And so why is this connection special? 
I, I suppose it's, I guess it's not. I, I mean, you're right that there are many different connections which preserve the almost remission structure. Um, this one is the one you get from, uh, how to explain, you, you look at the connection matrix, um, you know, as an SO6 valued matrix and you split it as SU3 plus its orthogonal complement with respect to the killing form. So that, that's how you would arrive at this. Um, and somehow oh, okay. it so respects it's like the killing form. Okay, so canonical in yeah. terms. Okay, all right. Yeah. yeah. That's a good answer. All uh, right. So, uh, yeah, so the question is, what does this null torsion condition mean? Um, so there's a bunch of ways to explain it. Um, here's, here's ways you can look at it. So let's remember that the normal bundle in, in our frame is E3456, uh, and J of E3 is E4, J of E5 is E6. Um, so we're going to define a new complex structure, um, mysteriously, J hat. And it's the same as J, um, again, it's just on the normal bundle. It's the same as J on the principal normal part. This is like the F2, but it has a flipped sign on the, on the binormal part on F3. And so one can show uh, that the following conditions are equivalent. Okay, so on the one hand, U is null torsion. Uh, another condition is that the binormal Gauss map, that's the map which takes a point and sends it to its binormal two plane. You view it as a complex line in C7. And uh, that map is a holomorphic curve is holomorphic, that's equivalent to being null torsion, that was shown by Robert Bryant. And an equivalent condition is that J hat is parallel for uh, D perp, and uh, an equivalent condition still is that J hat is parallel for the uh, normal part of the unitary connection. Okay, the upshot of this holomorphicity uh, characterization is that it allows you to view null torsion holomorphic curves, um, well, you can lift them to genuinely complex curves in an actual complex manifold, namely you can think of them as, you can lift them to complex curves in CP6. Uh, so consequently, uh, because of this, null torsion holomorphic curves have quantized area. Okay, the area must be uh, a multiple, uh, an integer multiple of four pi. This follows from uh, Werdinger's theorem in co uh, on complex curves. And here uh, D is the degree of this uh, binormal Gauss map. And uh, it, it turns out that D is one if you have the totally geodesic S2, but otherwise um, by Castel Nuovo's bound, essentially D has to be at least six. Okay. So, uh, okay, so the null torsion condition is very restrictive. And you might ask whether there are any examples of null torsion holomorphic curves at all. So uh, Robert Bryant showed uh, that first of all, every holomorphic curve of genus zero is null torsion. And there are in fact many holomorphic curves of genus zero. Not only that, he found a Weierstrass representation formula for null torsion holomorphic curves. You can kind of cook up or just generate null torsion holomorphic curves from, I don't remember how many holomorphic functions, basically. So this is analogous to the Weierstrass formula for minimal surfaces in R3. Using this Weierstrass formula together with a uh, rather deep, to me anyway, uh, an involved algebra geometric argument, uh, he proved a remarkable theorem. Uh, every, comp every closed Riemann surface can be immersed as a branched immersion uh, into S6 as a null torsion holomorphic curve. Okay, so there's like millions of these things. And it's quite remarkable that every genus arises and not only does every genus arise, but also every conformal structure arises as a null torsion holomorphic curve. And this was uh, sharpened by Roland in his uh, UChicago PhD thesis who improved uh, branched immersion to embedding. So um, this is a very rich class of uh, minimal surfaces in the sixth sphere. Uh, which brings us back to our question. So what can you say about the Jacobi spectrum of uh, let's say closed null torsion holomorphic curves in the sixth sphere? So G will be the genus, A will be the area. And again, uh, just from Ajiri's argument, he didn't say this explicitly, but if you look at his argument, it, it just gives you uh, this lower bound uh, M1 is at least the area over pi, uh, which is four times uh, the degree of the binormal Gauss map. And in the genus zero case, you get equality. And you might ask, well, how off is this bound for higher genus? Uh, do you ever get equality? What, what's the story here? Um, and we're able to show that if the genus is at most six, uh, then you do in fact get equality. So in particular, uh, M1 is uh, four times an integer, uh, which a priori was maybe not, uh, not obvious to me at least. So uh, how, how does one prove this? And um, you know, if you're not gonna use this uh, fact about holomorphic vector bundles over CP1 and, and also where does this uh, strange genus MO6 hypothesis come from anyway? 
So uh, both of those questions are answered by uh, the following slightly more general theorem, um, which is uh, what's done in the paper. So I show that, in fact, uh, more generally, there exists some holomorphic line bundle L, uh, which I won't explain here. And this line bundle has the following two properties. First, uh, M1 can be bounded above by the area over pi plus two times the number of holomorphic sections. And moreover, if this bound holds, if G is less than one half times D plus two, then the line bundle is negative and hence has no holomorphic sections. Okay, finally, it's just true from just general algebraic geometry facts that uh, G is at most six implies uh, this bound. So putting it all together, if the genus is at most six, then you get this condition. This condition implies that L has no holomorphic sections. So this term goes away. So you get the upper bound, couple it with the lower bound, and that shows how theorem A prime implies theorem A. We're also able to get a nullity bound, uh, and this nullity bound is true for all genera. Okay, so again, we're, we're focusing on closed uh, null torsion holomorphic curves in the sixth here, and we're able to show that the nullity is at least uh, 2D plus the Euler characteristic. This lower bound, uh, for reasons that will become clear shortly, is very, very not sharp, unfortunately. Uh, I wish it were, but it's, it's just, it's almost certainly not. Okay, so let me give uh, just very quickly um, the sketches, just some brief overviews of the sketches of theorem A prime and, and theorem B prime. Uh, we'll see if we can fit it all onto one slide. So the idea of theorem A prime is this, we're gonna give the normal bundle this strange, almost com uh, complex structure J hat, uh, where you flip the sign on the normal, on the binormal part. So now you have a complex vector bundle. And by the way, this was Ajiri's uh, complex vector bundle. This is where, he, this, this was his. Um, and you can think of it as a holomorphic vector bundle in two different ways depending on whether you use the Levi-Civita connection or the unitary connection. So you get two different holomorphic structures on uh, this complex bundle. And Ajiri shows that the first eigenspace, so the eigenspace of lambda one, uh, has this holomorphic interpretation as the normal vector fields, which are holomorphic with respect to D. Remember, that's the Levi-Civita connection. Okay. So a natural question is, you know, if the unitary connection really is uh, more geometric, what happens if we swap them? What happens if we replace um, the levi chibita holomorphic structure with the, with the unitary one? And what happens is you get this worse equation. Right? This, is just, this is just worse, right? Instead of having d bar equals zero, you now have d bar equals something else. Okay, so this seems like a terrible thing to do, um, but uh, there's this small miracle that occurs because of the null torsion condition uh, together with the particular geometry of the six sphere this otherwise horrible system decouples in the nicest possible way. Uh, and you can just look at the system, use Riemann rock like four times and get this upper bound uh, right here for some holomorph appropriate holomorphic line bundle L. And, and just by sort of naively counting solutions, you, you get the result. It's, it's, um, it's just kind of very lucky, frankly. Um, yeah, that's how this goes. For theorem B, um, the idea was to uh, more or less follow uh, an idea of Montiel and Urbano in their study of super minimal surfaces in the four sphere. So again, uh, equip and sigma the normal bundle with this weird complex structure J hat. And we'll think of the normal bundle as having again, the principal normal and the binormal part. And the uh, point is that uh, I was unable to find a holomorphic interpretation of the entire uh, null space, but uh, this subspace of the null space, this is the subspace on which the D bar of the normal vector field has no LB component. This subspace does have a holomorphic interpretation. It is, um, you can identify it with the space of holomorphic sections of this line bundle here. And the map is just taking derivatives. So you have to show that this map is well-defined, meaning that when you take D bar of Xi, you do actually get something holomorphic. That's not obvious a priori. And you have to show that this map is surjective. Uh, the only easy part is injectivity. Um, so again, so the point is that a subspace of the null space um, of the Jacobi operator has now been identified with the space of holomorphic sections. We know how to count holomorphic sections by riemann rock and this is what you get, okay? And because we considered a subspace of the null space, you can see why this estimate is uh, almost certainly not sharp because we're only looking at a subspace. Um, I didn't, you know, this was not an original argument. This is more or less what Montiel and Urbano do in their study of uh, infinitesimally holomorphic surfaces in S4, and it seems reasonable to believe that uh, this argument generalizes 
to a suitable class of surfaces in even dimensional spheres. I have not tried to do this, but this you probably get some sort of nullity bound in higher uh, even co-dimension. Okay, so uh, let me mention that I expect that there is an application of uh, these results, aside from being interesting uh, in and of themselves, I think I, I expect there to be applications to G2 geometry uh, in the following sense. Uh, holomorphic curves in S6 are links of uh, three-dimensional cones known as associative cones. And when you have a cone, uh, the natural instinct is to desingularize it and look at uh, the associative threefolds in R7 that are asymptotic uh, to that cone. So a study of uh, such three threefolds has been done by uh, Jason Lotte, for example. And I expect that theorems A and B will uh, have consequences for the deformation theory of these things. Uh, making this expectation precise is work in progress. Um, that will be reported on hopefully later this year. Okay, finally, I'd like to comment uh, briefly, very briefly on the case of holomorphic curves with boundary. Okay, now when you study minimal surfaces with boundary, you have to say what boundary condition you wanna look at. And uh, there's a couple of different boundary problems you might consider for holomorphic curves in the sixth sphere. So one of them is uh, Riemannian in spirit and the other is more symplectic in spirit. Let's look at the Riemannian one first. So uh, a free boundary problem, which has become quite popular, uh, I mean, incredibly popular in the last decade, work on this has kind of exploded, is uh, the free boundary problem. Okay, this is usually studied in Euclidean space, but one can also look at this in, in uh, space forms or general Riemannian manifolds, but, but let's look at it in spheres. The problem is this, uh, the problem is to study minimal surfaces in a geodesic ball that are free boundary. And what that means is that your minimal surface um, has boundary lying in the geodesic sphere. And moreover, the minimal surface has to hit the sphere orthogonal. Okay. And, and this orthogonality condition isn't uh, arbitrary. It comes from looking at the first variation formula for area. Okay, so there's been you know, a huge amount of work on this in the last 10 years. I cannot give a survey of this here, but uh, one result which is quite striking is the result of uh, Fraser and Shane. Okay, they show the following. If you have a free boundary minimal surface in, an, uh, in a geodesic ball of the n-sphere, then if your surface <clears throat> is topologically a disk, then there's only one option then your free boundary minimal surface must be totally geodesic. And what this means is that if you want to find interesting examples of uh, free boundary minimal surfaces um, in a geodesic ball, you have to consider non-trivial topology. So <clears throat> one might ask uh, what happens if you swap the topological condition with a geometric one? What happens if you, you know, study free boundary uh, holomorphic curves in a geodesic ball of the sixth sphere. Can you get interesting examples? Can you find examples with non-trivial topology? And uh, you can't. Uh, it turns out that you get the same conclusion. So if you have a free boundary holomorphic curve in a geodesic ball of the sixth sphere of any topology a priori, then uh, in fact, it must be a piece of the totally geodesic S2. Okay, so there was no topological assumption. That's part of the conclusion. And in a sense, maybe this is disappointing, but on the other hand, this gives a nice um, uh, rigidity, rigidity theorem for closed holomorphic curves with reflection uh, symmetry. So if you have a, a totally geodesic five sphere, call it P, and you have a closed connected holomorphic curve that's reflection invariant across P, and assuming your holomorphic curve doesn't actually live in P, but does intersect it transversely, then uh, your holomorphic curve, which again, a priori had any topology, uh, must in fact be the totally geodesic S2. So that's, a, that's an immediate corollary of uh, this result. Uh, both of these results are proved uh, using a Hopf differential type argument. So more complex analysis, basically. Uh, finally, uh, I'll mention that, uh, you know, another boundary condition you can study comes from symplectic geometry. Uh, this is typically what's done for holomorphic curves in a symplectic manifold. One looks at holomorphic curves uh, with boundary lying on a Lagrangian. Okay, now S6 is not a symplectic manifold, but it does have an almost Hermitian structure, and that's enough uh, to phrase uh, to set up this boundary problem. Okay, so uh, recall that a submanifold of the sixth sphere, it's Lagrangian if what you think is true is true. So if it's a half dimensional submanifold, so three dimensional, and the two form restricts to uh, L your Lagrangian to be zero. This is the definition of being Lagrangian. And uh, so this is a problem that arises in symplectic geometry. So, so what can you say um, about these things? Is this even a, a good problem to consider? 
Uh, and and it, a very interesting thing happens. Typically, when you look at uh, you know, the second variation formula for holomorphic curves or just surfaces with boundary, you're going to get two integrals. You're going to get some uh, integral on the interior, and you'll also get some integral uh, on the boundary. But it's a, I won't overstate it, but, but it's a small miracle. It's, 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 a, it's a nice fact, at least that for holomorphic curves with Lagrangian boundary in not just the sixth sphere, but in any nearly Kähler uh, six manifold, this boundary term kind of goes away. So this is a kind of a sense that, you know, this gives the impression that this is, I, I think, a very natural uh, thing to study. And uh, from this fact, you can get uh, just very easily, you can get a Morse index bound uh, using a suitable version of Riemann rock for holomorphic curves with boundary. So you can show that the Morse index is at least this uh, topological quantity. Uh, where this mu is the so-called boundary Maslow index. Uh, I won't define what this is. Um, you can read about it somewhere else. Uh, but I should mention that this is integer valued, um, unfortunately. So, it, you know, of course, if this number is negative or zero, then of course this uh, index bound is, is useless. But I, I do expect that there are uh, plenty of examples, hopefully, where uh, this number is, is positive. Okay, so I'll wrap up with some uh, open questions. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Okay, just making sure. So yeah, so we'll wrap up with some open questions. Um, so for closed holomorphic curves in S6, it would be nice to find a lower bound for lambda two. Um, I was unsuccessful in doing so. Uh, one thing you might try though, is to look at the simplest closed holomorphic curve in the six sphere, uh, other than the totally geodesic S2. The simplest example is the Borovka sphere, or maybe the Borovka Veronese surface, if you like. It's the unique holomorphic curve with Gaussian curvature one sixth. Excuse me, and you can define it um, by means of uh, homogeneous harmonic cubics. It's an orbit of the uh, irreducible uh, SO3 action on R7. And uh, presumably in this case, uh, it's probably the case that one could try to uh, compute maybe uh, here, maybe one could get the spectrum uh, explicitly. Uh, I was able to show that lambda two is at least negative five thirds, but maybe. Uh, uh, you wonderful symmetry people can can, uh, can do better, uh, and that would be that would be great, I think. And uh, finally, I'll just I'll just uh, mention uh, just uh, a pattern which is kind of interesting. So if you have a, a, a what's called a super minimal surface um, in an even dimensional sphere, um, Ajiri's arguments um, again just a minor modification gives you this lower bound. And an interesting question is when equality is you know when do you get equality? And at this point, we now have a quality in a number of uh, special situations. For example, when G is zero, the genus is zero, when K is two, or when, uh, in our case, when K is three, the genus is at most six, and U is a holomorphic curve. And uh, it would be interesting to know whether equality is true more generally uh, for super minimal surfaces um, in even dimensional spheres. This is a pretty large class, I, I believe, of uh, closed minimal surfaces. And it would be, uh, I, I think it's, it's I think maybe this would be an interesting starting point for some uh, some further questions. So, uh, thanks uh, for your attention. Thanks, Jess. Great talk. Are there any questions or comments for speaker? Yeah, so I do have a, maybe it's a stupid question, but in this the last um, question, I mean, the, not the last question, the second to last question uh, with the homogeneous sphere. So the, the sphere will be a, a round sphere embedded in S6, right? That's right, but in a non-trivial way. Yeah, it, it's, it's full in S6. It doesn't lie in any S5. I see, okay. Okay, so, but it is extrinsically homogeneous, right? Uh, so, yes, somehow everything is constant, so to speak. Uh, yes, yes. I, I, I don't believe the second fundamental form is parallel, uh, unfortunately, but uh, yeah, there, there are many nice, uh, well, for I mean, the most part, not, I, I believe, yeah. It's not parallel, but it's, uh, but it's maybe constant length or something. Invariant, yeah. right? For, I mean, it's, yeah. when, once you know it at one point, you know it everywhere. Right, essentially, because uh, because the SO three is uh, consists of ambient isometries, right? So even with that much symmetry, it's still not clear what the 
for the spectrum if that's the reason. It, it's not clear to me, but I mean, maybe, uh, yeah, I, I mean, maybe, uh, I think probably one needs to use knowledge of the spectrum of the Laplacian on, on a two sphere. Right. And uh, presumably that will help. And uh, I think this is known for the corresponding uh, example of the Veronese surface in S4. In, in that case, uh, one, uh, Montiel and Arbano computed the spectrum. Uh, but they use very crucially the fact that for the Veronese surface in S4, the second fundamental form of that is parallel. Uh, that was pretty central in, in their calculation. And um, since you don't have that in this case, I, I was unable to uh, uh, figure out what to do. But uh, uh, this isn't to say it's not doable. In fact, I think it is doable. I, I just, I personally don't know how to do, uh, how to do it. Um, but maybe uh, one of you could figure it out. <laughs> yeah. Emilio, Emilio should be able to help you. No question. <laughs> Yeah, one remark maybe that the analog of the Boruf, Borufka sphere in S4 might be more the Clifford torus than the Veronese curve because it's not super minimal. Ah, oh. oh, right, right. I suppose so. I suppose so. Oh, which one isn't super minimal? The the, the, the Clifford torus isn't. Right, but the Borufka is. Right. Oh, it is. Okay, sorry. Then I take everything. Yeah, 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 yeah. It is. It, it's null torsion. Yeah, this is null torsion, which is good. Yeah. Because it's genus zero, right? So. Uh, yeah, right, exactly. Okay. Any further questions or comments for the speaker? Well, I mean, something if it's. Not, I did, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, something I didn't. Why can't. So, why can't you use a similar computation as for the Veronese curve then? Uh, because the computation that I know of for the Veronese surface in S4 uses the fact that the second fundamental form is parallel. And that doesn't seem to be the case here. And I think you, you get a bunch of terms which I didn't know what to do with. Um, again, this isn't to say it's not possible. I, I just, I, I had a little bit of difficulty with it uh, because of the second fundamental form not being parallel. The, 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 again, I, I believe it is dual. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, so there are no more questions. Let's thank Chess again for a great talk.